The dominant culture plays an undeniable role in shaping perceptions about what women can or cannot do. How can we make it the norm for women to be astronauts, scientists, actors, entertainers, and chase whatever dreams they might have? What role does film play in shaping our perceptions and our culture? We have a very special guest here with us to tell us. Yara Shahidi, actor, producer, and change agent, will be in conversation with Cartier's Head of Diversity and Inclusion, Erica Levitt. Hi, Yara. Hi, how are you? I'm doing well, how are you? I'm pretty good. Well, I'm very excited to be speaking with you today. Um, and thank you to everyone who is tuning in for our conversation. It's going to be a really great discussion. Um, and before we, be we begin, I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the anniversary of the murder of George Floyd. The impact of George Floyd's death was felt around the world, and it's important that we continue to advocate for racial justice and social justice. Mm -hmm. This ties directly to our conversation today about representation, because we know that the way people and communities are represented and dominant narratives has a profound impact on their lived experiences. So with that said, let's begin our conversation. Yara, you've had an incredible career so far. You started acting at a young age. And so I'm just curious, I'd love to know, when did you realize that you're a storyteller? Mm -hmm. And how, how has being a storyteller impacted the work that you decide to move forward with? Mm, um, that's a wonderful question. I wanna start by saying just how grateful I am to be in conversation with you and just the importance of, of bringing George Floyd's presence into the room as, like you said, it's something that is so felt and resonant and really has shifted how, how society has moved. Um, but to your question about storytelling, I, I feel like I entered this business in a way that is somewhat unusual. It was very much a hobby, something that was family oriented, having a family in the industry. It never took me out of school. And my parents always ensured that I was really invested in my other passions. Uh, so much so that it was common for us to say, acting is something we do, but not who we are. And in many ways, as, as random as that sounds, it really does inform my perspective as a storyteller. My mother's always said there's nothing more interesting than an interested human. And I think that's what I've really carried with me into my work because of my love of history, because of my love of the humanities and arts and global cultures. I think it gave me a really solid foundation in which to move into television and understand the repercussions of the stories we were told because I understand the impact of the stories I've been told growing up and the importance of always being immersed in cultures other than my own, identities other than my own. And so because of that, Blackish felt like the perfect kind of first entrance to be doing regular and, and serious television work because it took on the mantle of trying to have these conversations in a way that felt accessible to people. And now not only in Grownish, but really moving into my own work um, through production, it's taken on new meaning because it's no longer about creating media that's limited to the characters I can play, but Production is all about collaboration. It's about saying that these are not stories that may, that are my own, but they're stories that I relate to. And so let's bring in people to collaborate, to bring this front and center. Um, and in doing that work, we see the difference because for so many people, um, especially if you're dominant culture, you have not been introduced to narratives other than your own. And then the, the obvious misfortune of being in the intersections is that oftentimes you're not even introduced to your own story. And so it's been really wonderful to, even in a small way, make impact in that work. Mm. You know, you, you spoke a little bit about um, having exposure to different cultures and different identities. And so, you know, that to me is, is spot on when we talk about representation and how people are represented in media. And so I would love to know a little bit more about um, how the representation of women in particular in non-traditional roles, and let's go further and say women of color, how has that representation impacted 
um, you know, how you view yourself, you view yourself as an actress and as a producer, right? The decisions that you make around being an actress and as and being a producer when it comes to representation. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd have to start by saying I was in a household that kind of paradoxically didn't watch much television. And so if anything, I felt the impact of women in my life even more profoundly because my examples were literally the people set in front of me, the, the uh, women in my family, both Iranian and black, that were um, really helping form environments of inclusivity. I come from a family of educators um, and of varying levels. I come from families of people that really revel in community. And so in many ways, having that as an example, I walked into the world feeling armed to take on anything that came my way. I was raised to believe that not even the sky was the limit. And I had that example in front of me. And I think it was a really jarring transition entering my young adulthood and really intaking media more for the first time ever in a way that wasn't so curated and realizing just how detrimental these images are. And if you don't come from a household or an environment that's able to create that space for you, how are you supposed to go into the world feeling confident in, in your ability? particularly because some of the most damaging images is not what it makes you think of yourself, but what other people think of you. And so the expectation for your abilities has already been set before you enter a room. Um, and so in many ways, I, I think it really comes from having such an interpersonal relationship with what representation has done for me via my aunties, via the educators in my life, via all of these people that really informed who I am. Um, and then I said, well, if this is the impact it's had on me, how can we put that in media? And it's not about creating superhumans because we know that that can be a trap as well. The idea of being villainized or or heroicized doesn't allow for humanity. And so many times, especially if you're a woman of color, that's precisely what's lacking in people's understanding of us is the ability to have our entire humanity expressed. Mm. So, so let's dive into that a little bit more. Let's talk about diversity and media, right? Um, we know that there historically has not been a lot of representation of underrepresented people and communities um, and, and dominant narratives. And I'm curious because, you know, we've seen, we've been seeing a call to action for a more inclusive and a more equitable industry. So what do you believe is influencing more diversity in front of and behind the camera? That's the first question. And the second question is, how can we change the way we tell stories for a more inclusive picture? Right. Uh, well, I think going to your first question of what's informing this kind of recent call for inclusivity, I, I think it's this idea of really understanding the gravity of the impact media makes on us. It's not some trivial thing we watch and these images influence us. They influence policy. They influence what we think of the communities around us. When we think of harmful stereotypes, there are so many ways in which those stereotypes that we think just exist in movies or exist in television informed policy. It's informed the way communities have been treated, how we police our communities and how we support our communities. And so I think first and foremost, people are fed up. There's also, I think, a history that I've been diving into personally as of late of the of the impact of inclusive media throughout time. I, I think oftentimes we feel like this is a brand new thing, but there have been filmmakers and people who have been subverting what media has traditionally done for generations. And I feel like there is a generation of people who are now taking on the mantle of that work to say, okay, let's continue it. Let's put it in, in kind of mainstream um, images and mainstream television because it's important. And then to that kind of latter half of your question, there is um, a moment of realizing that oftentimes the reason diversity on screen has not lasted or it's felt like flashpoints of, wow, we have really brown people on television. Okay, they're gone. Okay, wow, we have really inclusive uh, images of, of the varying uh, ways we identify on television and then it's gone is because the infrastructure hasn't matched. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes the reason it kind of comes in waves is because there are no consistent advocates. There are no people that consistently feel the stakes of the importance of this work. And so I love the fact that we are turning uh, to what's happening behind the camera 
uh, even and paying more attention to that, because if anything, once we get that sorted, what happens in front of the camera is going to explode in a really beautiful way. Um, and then if you can remind me of your second question, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it's just, you know, how how can we make sure that moving forward that we are we are um, creating more inclusive stories and, and pictures. And I, I think you've touched on it a, a little bit already, but you know, to your point, there, there we see all these commitments, right? I I work in diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so, you know, I'm in luxury goods, but we see across media and Hollywood that there are there are many commitments um, both in front of and behind the camera around inclusion. So I'm curious about how do you think moving forward we can create a more inclusive picture. Sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think you already touched on it and we discussed it a little before, but it comes to really changing the infrastructure behind the camera, but also this idea of who do we pay attention to? I, I think of um, my own kind of growing up in as diverse as the schools I went to were, the kind of traditional canon of literature, um, when I think of Catcher in the Rye, which used to be one of my all-time favorite books, I think of the fact that we have been trained to watch dominant culture narratives in whatever form they come in. We've been trained to say that they are worthy of our attention, even if it's a book with little to no plot, just following a kid who kind of complains the whole time. And so part of it is training our audience. So many times, I don't know how many times I've heard that the audience drives what's on television. But in many ways, I think that is an excuse to say we can't step out of what is comfortable because how is the audience going to respond? And what we know to be true is that if you treat people as, as the well-educated viewers that they are, to say, if I present you with an image, I expect that you're going to rise to the occasion and understand the importance of this image, then it changes what we think is possible on television. Mm -hmm. I, I'm a deep believer, even in the, the little influence I have over Gronish, is in saying it's not just about... Uh, matching the viewer where they are, but really helping us go to the next place and our next level of potentiality. I, and even in that, as an audience member myself, as much as I make television, I watch television. And that's what I want from my media. That's what I want from ads. That's what I want from every image I see, is to bring me to places I didn't realize existed. And I think when that becomes kind of the call to action in your work, then there are so many more possibilities to understand what diversity looks like. So many people, if you haven't invested the time to understand what inclusivity is, then it feels like, okay, we're just checking boxes. Versus no, we're telling stories stories. And what's been very important is that, you know, with um, a show like Blackish, what was more impactful is not just that there was a Blackish, but that there were so many shows coming out at the same time of different brown stories. And so if anything, it taught people to say, you know, Blackish doesn't represent every Black family. Mm -hmm. And it would be a disservice to our community to expect that. But what is, what is inclusivity is saying that here's one iteration of what it means to be a Black family. Here's another one on TV. And no matter where you turn, you're getting a fuller picture. And so when I think of inclusivity, I always add the caveat of not every show is supposed to be everything, but we're supposed to create space for every story. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would say also, I'm, I get really excited about the next generation, Gen Z, because I think there's an expectation from Gen Z that inclusion is a part of everything, right? It's not diversity on one hand, inclusion on the other, equity on another. It's that within every industry, there needs to be inclusion, a part of every single process. And so I, this next question is about Gen Z. Um, I'm going to read some stats because I think, I think it's important to know the statistics before we get into the question. So according to the U.S. Census data, Gen Z is the most diverse generation in American history. In 2019, for the first time, more than half of the nation's population under age 16 identified as a racial or ethnic minority. And around 50% of Gen Z believes that traditional gender norms are outdated. Gen Z clearly is the future. So what is one step we can take to engage with the next generation and encourage them to tell their own stories and drive change? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, just as your own statistics shared, um, there is something to be said for the fact that Generation Z expects change mm -hmm. and expects uh, for inclusive representation. So I don't think it's even a matter of saying, hey, share your stories. It's a matter of giving people access. 
when I look at my peers, they're already storytellers. Some of them very formally and explicitly and some implicitly. And I think that was even evident in when you look at this past year of social action and engagement. Gen Z was at the forefront of being able to communicate new narratives and being able to say, even if my space is in tech, even if my space is in fashion, in media, in the business and corporate world, there's a way in which I can tell a story of impact that is going to help us shift how this industry thinks we need to be holding ourselves accountable. And so for those reasons, I really focus on the idea of access. And when I look at even my own position, my goal is not to be the voice of a generation by any means, but I've always said my role is to be able to say, here's the access I've had. How do I share this access with other people? How do I expand the opportunities given to me to other people? Because the interest and ability is already there. It's just as so much of this conference is about, it's about the investment. Mm. You, I mean, that's a really great point. I would also say, I, I think that there are pros and cons to social media, but I think social media has really allowed Gen Z to, to, to set their own um, guidelines, you know, and to say, forget about all these um, norms that we've, we've um, been taught to believe in. Like with social media, you can express yourself however you want to, you can, you know, share your story however you want to. And so, um, I, I think it's a, a beautiful moment for the next generation, and I believe we'll be seeing much more. And you know, hopefully, these larger companies and, and these huge industries will begin to adapt more and to realize the the impact and um, just the 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 profound. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just the magnitude of this generation, right? Like no one wants to, to conform to these same old identities and gender norms that we have to allow people to really be who they are and to not lock them in a box. So I'm very excited to see um, what Gen Z has in store for all of us. Um, and, you know, you talked a little bit earlier about your mother. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about um, the women in your lives who've had it in your life who have had an influence on you. And I, I want to dive into that a bit more. I'm, I would love to know a little bit more about who you consider role models and mentors. I'm a huge advocate for mentorship. You know, I believe that there are formal mentors and informal mentors. It's great mm -hmm. to have both. I think a lot of times people get stuck on formal mentors, but we know that there are so many people in our lives that have um, an impact on us in ways that we don't expect. Mm -hmm. So can you share a little bit about um, who your mentors are, how you form those relationships, and what is the best advice you've ever received from a mentor? Oh, that's a great question. Well, just like I had said in that first kind of question, of course, I have to turn to my aunts. I have to turn to my mama as some of my first mentors. And then when I'm looking at kind of broader picture, the people that have come in to take that place in my life, I think of incredible humans like Patrice Colors, who's one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. And I literally snuck into an event she was speaking at just to hear her speak. And that is where we met. And I think in many impactful ways, she's helped guide me uh, through this world, especially as I figure out what it means to be socially engaged and really how to be of service. Um, another person I am just always floored by the fact that I know is, is Dr. Angela Davis. Um, I think of people, even in my own kind of immediate ethos and system of entertainment, and there's so many people that I think I regularly turn to um, as just a source of inspiration. So many of our collaborators, many of the, the women writers that we bring on teach us so much in a matter of, of moments just by beginning our collaboration. And so I feel like the list is really endless, but those are two people that really come top of mind. I'm so jealous, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I want to speak to all of them. <laughs> and what about um, the best advice you've ever received from oh, them? Best advice. I mean, I think a lot of the best advice has really been, especially as a young woman, figuring out how to take care of myself and how to set up boundaries mm. has been really wonderful, especially hearing that from people who have dedicated their lives to being of service. They've really helped me try and continue to maneuver the space of knowing that I want to ensure that everything I do is for the greater good. And I'm a young person in this world. How do I make sure I'm taking care of myself? And I think words that my mother had even said that really impacted me, and it was only a matter of a year ago, is that in order to do my best work of taking care of others, I have to take care of myself. 
And in many ways, I, I know it's not just something that I've heard, but something that's been implied to many women is that self-care is selfish mm -hmm. and that taking time for yourself is luxurious. It's exorbitant and excessive versus deeming it as essential. And if we were to take it out of just the kind of um, literal understanding of doing a face mask, although that's great self-care too, so self-care mm -hmm. consists of so many things. And when I think of the fact that when I pour into myself, I just operate at a higher level, it's helped me continue to push against my own understanding of what I deserve. Yeah, you know, it's the idea that you can't pour from an empty cup. And I think it's mm -hmm. so important to refuel and recharge. And I'm also curious, you know, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption that you have mm -hmm. um, many young people that are looking to you for mentorship. And I'm, I'm just curious, how do you manage those relationships and expectations, right? Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to make another assumption that you're very busy and you have a lot <laughs> going on. And, you know, between school and work and all the other incredible things that you're doing, um, you know, how, how, what does that look like when people, you know, come to you or are seeking mm -hmm. mentorship? Well, it's always funny because at the age of 21, I tend to feel like I am in no position to give anyone advice <laughs> as I'm still figuring things out. And so oftentimes I think I reframe the relationship from being a mentor to just being a peer and saying, let me be of service and let me help you out where I can. And let me also be brutally honest about the limitations of what I know and what you have to turn to other people. Um, but a great example for me has even been my own mother. She mentors many folks. And I know even in the last week, I was talking to two of her mentees and that she's helping in different capacities. And I think she has taught me really what it means to be attentive and the ways that you can pour into people and the way that that can be individualized. And so being a mentor, having that relationship um, looks different for everyone. But I, I think in terms of even establishing a healthy relationship, something my grandfather has talked about since I was little is the idea of relationship equity. You know, as much as I'm new to the mentor world, I have been a mentee for many years. Hmm. And it's very important for me to frame this idea of as much as I am expecting to get from other people, I have to actively be pouring into them. And just mm -hmm. because I feel like I'm the one that knows less in this relationship, I always have something to offer. And that can uh, come from even the difference of calling in between asking for things mm -hmm. or having that level of attentiveness, which means that there's always something for me to contribute to a conversation. Uh, has really been helpful because I think as I make this kind of transition to being of service in a new way for other people coming behind me, I, I have that kind of in my general arsenal to be able to figure out how to establish these relationships. Yeah, you know, I one of the things that I think a lot about is peer to peer mentorship. I think mm -hmm. oftentimes, um, people are so focused on um, looking above and, you know, you know, looking at who's at the, the top of, of their industry and, you know, how can I get a, a coffee with them or how can I reach out to them? Mm -hmm. But I personally have learned the most from my peers, right? Mm -hmm. People who are literally on the ground going through what I'm going through at the same time. And so I think it's so important to your point about, you know, when, when you're looking for a mentor or you find someone that you think could be a great mentor, it is a, um, it's a mutual relationship, right? It's not just one person always giving, it's giving and receiving and vice versa. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think it's one of the most important things to rem remember for everyone on um, who's tuned in right now that, you know, when you're looking for a mentor, just remember that the, re the relationship goes both ways. Right. It's not it's not one sided. Absolutely. All right. So we are down to our final question. And I hate that this conversation oh, is ending. I know. I know. It's crazy. We'll have to, we'll have to do this again sometime. But, um, you know, the theme of the Cartier's Women, Women's Initiative this year is a ripple effect. And so I would love to know, you know. What if we were to start a ripple effect to change the way we present the narrative about diversity in general? What's the one thing that you would leave us with, the one action that you think is crucial to driving change? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. It's a heavy question. It is. It's a heavy question. So take your time with this one. It, it is heavy, but I think it, it's so important. My first instinct as a self-professed history nerd is to have people committed to learning our histories. When I look at the biases people carry with them, so much of it is because people can operate in the world feeling as though the communities around them have not been of service to their mm -hmm. personal journeys. There's this feeling of independence as though we came and materialized on our own and just magically had what we had. 
um, versus feeling like I am not able to even be here if it weren't for generations before my own cultures and cultures I'm unfamiliar with, people that I know personally and people I will never have met. Um, and I think that kind of orientation towards the world has really shifted even the feeling of I have to be committed. Um, one of my tattoos is 63 for 1963. It's a pivotal year in the civil rights movement, but that's because it is embodied to me people that were committed to a future world that they weren't guaranteed. That is the most selfless work you can do is to say, I'm fighting for something and putting my life on the line for people I haven't met. And I, I often carry that with me. And so I think the one thing that could be impactful in ways that people may not even expect, or we may not know the outcomes immediately to creating a more diverse world is turning to our own histories and trying to figure out what has been left out. Who do I not know about? I, I know that I, by the age of 10, knew way too much about Napoleon Bonaparte than I should before I even got to my own stories and the stories of my families and my communities. Um, and if we look at the information that we've taken in as being so narrow, it really colors in our world and expands what we feel like we can do when we start to add in new stories. And so even though it sounds like a broad task, I feel like it could have really wonderful repercussions, just dedicating a little bit of your time, whether it be every day, every week, every month, to just learning something outside of what you typically would have read, learning about people outside of who you typically interface with, because I, I think it implicitly, you carry that with you and mm -hmm. you carry that into your work. Yeah, the, to be to be curious and to always ask, you know, what stories aren't being told. I think that is that is crucial. And I think Yara, you're doing a phenomenal job um, in your own life and your own career journey. We're so grateful to have you as a, you know, as a role model to so many people, you know, young, old, everywhere in between. And it's been such a pleasure speaking with you today. I'm looking forward to hearing your keynote and looking forward to seeing all that you continue to accomplish. Thank you, Erica. I've been so looking forward to this conversation. And I know it's just the beginning of, of so many wonderful things, but just thank you for your time. Absolutely. Take care. It has been a tremendous honor to be your host for the Cartier Women's Initiative. Not only have I been deeply moved by the speakers and the 2020 and 2021 fellows, I've grown in my own leadership as a founder. We launched this morning with Jacqueline Novogratz, who taught us that empathy without action will result in the status quo and implored all of us to exercise our moral imagination. We then moved to our lightning talks where we were reminded of the traits that make a successful social impact entrepreneur. Traits like curiosity, drive, patience, trust, nonconformism, and transparency. We learned about the importance of sponsorship and that it's a two-way street. According to Mercedes Abramo, senior leaders should be intentional about identifying talent that we can invest in and that we can also learn from. And while we can all plan for the future, we were delighted by the power of serendipity in our second round of lightning talks. We learned that gender lens investing is all about investing in a woman whose vision for the future you might be unable to see. And from Ellen Ochoa, we learned that a woman undeterred can break not only glass ceilings, but the Earth's atmosphere. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you were just as inspired as I was to create your own ripple effect by supporting the women entrepreneurs who are creating change in the world. I invite each of you to tune into the 2021 Cartier Women's Initiative Award Ceremony on May 26th. You can watch on the event platform at Cartier Women's Initiative 2021.com. As our women impact entrepreneurs have modeled for us, when in doubt, go for the impossible. I can't wait to see what levels you reach. <laughs>